You're watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte. Timothy chapter number four. For the sound man, I, I hear myself out there, but I don't hear myself down here. And if I hear myself here, then my self-esteem goes up. If my self-esteem goes up, I preach shorter. <laughs> That's the truth. That's a little bit too much. You want me to dismiss right now. That's probably a hodge up there. Antichrist. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter four, verse number six. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand I have fought the good fight I have finished the race I have kept the faith finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will give to me on that day and not to me only but also to all who have loved his appearing appearing amen all right we're at the end of the journey Somebody say in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you. You may be seated. I feel somewhat guilty having a rather somber subject in the middle of a holiday season. Uh, but there's naught to be done at this moment. Uh, Paul has walked a long way from where we started I think back in July, August, as an individual who zealously persecuted the church, as an individual, as an individual who encouraged and participated in the, the persecution and even the death of believers, uh, to the man struck down on the road having a revelation of who God really was, not just who he thought God was. I think all of us, particularly at different times and seasons of our, of, of, of our life, we need to be reminded of who God really is and not just who we think he is. Because if we're not careful, we, we begin to project our own ideals and our own plans and our own schemes onto God. But God is above all. And God is in heaven and we're on earth. We should make a note of it. <laughs> and so Paul, from that moment, desires so zealously to be a part of God's work. There's no doors open to him. He is a feared man. And rather than losing his faith because there was no place for him, I've seen people that, that wouldn't serve God in a congregation because uh, no one would give them a title or no one would give them a ministry or no, no one would put them in charge of anything. So they, 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 they completely lost um, any interest in serving God in that, that congregation. Um, that this, these things ought not to be. Uh, Paul does not lose his faith, but he patiently waits he goes through a time of preparation. He goes through a time of waiting. And those were uh, in many ways the same thing, but it probably didn't feel that way to Paul. After Paul had grown in great knowledge of the Lord and the time he spent in the wilderness, he was ready for a door to be opened. He probably felt ready. He came back. He preached with zeal. He preached with passion. You would think that someone would be moved. No one was moved and said there was a riot. And so he went back. He went back to the... A city where he had much, uh, it was kind of a home to him. And there he waited, and he waited, and he waited. Went back to Tarsus. And finally, remember the story, Barnabas thought he could use uh, help uh, in Antioch. And so he invites him to come. And Paul has his first opportunity of ministry nearly a decade after his revelation on the road uh, where the Lord revealed to him who God really was. Uh, and Paul then begins the missionary journeys. And while he goes, he preaches when he has a place to preach. He teaches when he has a place to preach. He strives with Gentiles. He strives with Jews. He is a man of God. And when he can't preach, he writes. And he writes for us during these missionary journeys. 
uh, two-thirds of the New Testament. I iter iterated several times at the beginning of this, and I want to establish it again because it is fundamental. I, I spent years thinking myself to be um, very well, uh, well acquainted with the New Testament and never realized this. Uh, Paul serves a function for us quite like the law served for the Old Testament. The Bible says the law was a schoolmaster, and the law taught them of their desperate need of God. Isn't it interesting, and let me just take a, a quick aside here, isn't it interesting that God will not do something if he has a man or a woman who will do it for him? God only does that which he has no one to do for him. Uh, Jesus didn't baptize. Why not? Well, he had John the Baptist for that. Uh, they were contemporary. Uh, Jesus didn't teach theology, not in the sense of an instructional. He taught theology in the sense of a narrative. That's why the gospel stories are given to us in the form of narratives, and it's quite hard to do systematic theology in a narrative. You tell a story in a narrative. We needed someone. We needed a teacher to take the story of God's Love and mercy from Genesis all the way through the New Testament. And we needed someone to let us see there was a cohesiveness to it all. The New Testament was not simply the end of the Old Testament. It was the fulfillment of the Old Testament. We needed to understand systematically the integration of the Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, and the Christian Bible, the New Testament. We all call it the Bible, but it's commonly referred to in that way. Uh, we had to have someone to teach us systematic theology. And there's only two people who do it, and I tend to think they're the same person. And that is the Apostle Paul in his many, many books. And that is the author of the book of Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews is a very formalized presentation of systematic theology. Uh, Paul's epistles are largely very pastoral presentations of systematic theology. Uh, but John writes uh, beautiful three beautiful letters. Uh, he, 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 he does not touch on the breadth of what Paul will explain. Peter writes two beautiful epistles. Uh, he does not even touch on the breadth of the systematic theology that Paul will bring to our understanding. If you want to understand the church age, you have to understand Paul. If you want to understand New Testament theology, you have to understand Paul. And so he has given himself and poured himself out. And we followed him through four uh, if you count it that way, uh, what's more famously counted as three, and then his trip to Jerusalem. Uh, some authors count it as four, the trip to, not Jerusalem, but to Rome being the fourth journey. But Paul gets out of Rome barely ahead of the beginning of Roman persecution. Um, Nero, uh, flawed man, he begins the persecution of the Christians by blaming them for the fire of Rome that raged out of control, burned down over 75% of Rome, and he, uh, he blamed the Christians for that, and he began as sport. It would have been one thing to blame them for that. It would have been one thing to investigate them for causes. That's not what he did. He turned the persecution of Christians into a circus. And so Nero, Nero uh, has started this. This is 65 A.D. Paul slipped out of Rome in 64. And he begins a time of a rather quite low profile because Christianity is now an outlawed religion. He does not hide anything from anyone. In fact, he writes to Timothy, as we talked about last time, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Paul is establishing these these uh, this strong stand of not being ashamed even though now you risk your life. However, it's much more dangerous and he doesn't provoke near the riots he once provoked. Now he inter he's interested in sp spending time with churches. He spends three years um, between the first Roman imprisonment and the second Roman imprisonment and we have much less detail as we talked about last week. <clears throat> Finally, in 68 A.D., which would be uh, 
three years after this persecution of the Christians began. Uh, he is arrested in a place called Nicopolis, and he is brought back to Rome. He is charged as an evildoer. Rumors had started against the Christians that they killed, they had human sacrifice, and that they drank the blood and ate the flesh. Uh, they did not understand, the, per, the Romans did not understand the spiritual significance of communion. And they turned it into an ugly story and then used it against the Christians. They accused him of being an evildoer and it was because he preached Christ. It was illegal to do so, but Paul preached Christ. He just evidently did not do it in quite the same manner he had done it in the three missionary journeys where he has a riot in every town. I don't know of any one riot he had in these three years where he's trying to minister to the churches without necessarily having the same high profile he once had. Uh, when Paul comes back to Rome, it's a much different environment. The city is really a shadow of its former self. The people are living in hovels and tents. Seventy-five percent of the city is burned down. Uh, they are rebuilding, but it is a great mess, you can imagine. And uh, Paul is no longer held as a Roman citizen in house arrest. Uh, interesting for empires, Rome did not have great prisons. Um, it's... It's, it's quite an interesting psychological or sociological study to, to look in, in societies in terms of the prisons they build. Um, America, we, we have more people in prison than the rest of the free world combined. Um, we have more people in prison than, than many of the nations we call, we call barbaric combined. And although we, for the most part, trust the justice system, uh, and by that I mean most part, <laughs> um, uh, the, system, the system has its flaws, of course. It's an interesting thought process to think about a society in terms of its prisons. Um, Rome is famous as an empire. It doesn't have prisons. If you're a Roman citizen and you are arrested, uh, you are arrested to your home. And you are told if you leave your home, you will be you will be, uh, you can be, in the best case, fine, in the worst case, killed on the spot. Paul, in his first Roman imprisonment, was held in this way. Uh, however, there is a prison in Rome. It's just not very big, and it just really gets people that are famously held. They are in, in infamy. They are held in infamy, we might would we might would say. You can visit it today. It's at the bottom of the Capitoline Hill. And uh, Paul was marched down to this prison in 68 AD. And uh, if you were standing at the base of this hill, you could see in the distance the, the white marble of the forum which had uh, survived the fire. Um, if you look down a few more steps, you would find literally a hole in the ground. You would be led into a room. There's a hole in the center of the room. Uh, they would let you down with a rope uh, into a hole that is in the ground. And you would find yourself in a room packed with people approximately 30 feet long and 22 feet wide, which is a little bit smaller than our vestibule, if you want to think of it that way. Um, it is a small room. The ceiling is only six and a half feet, so at any time you can raise your hand and hit the ceiling. Um, it is dark. It is dank. There are no windows. There's just a hole. And people who are condemned to die either by strangulation or starvation are held there. Oftentimes, they would just throw you down there and let you starve to death. There was no cafeteria service. If you were fed, your friends would come and feed you. Right next to it, uh, the Coloca Maxima, which is the uh, main sewer of Rome, passes right beside it. Uh, and so there's the continual smell of the main sewer of the whole city. Uh, and there you are held in this literal dungeon, uh, waiting, waiting until a decision is made in your uh, case or literally in your destiny. Uh, this is where Paul is marched and this is where he is left. Uh, his trial that he has uh, when he is first arrested, if we understand the sequence correctly, um, he evidently was tried initially. Uh, you, you can read a passage here in chapter number 4 just after this uh, where he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. 
Um, you also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. Paul and his initial arrival in Rome is tried in some sort of a court. And this is what he refers to if we understand the sequence. Most scholars believe this. Uh, this passage here. Um, and no one speaks. It, it, the Christians are understandably fearful. And what could they say? The very charges against Paul were such that no Christian could make a defense of them. Christian was an outlawed religion. An only Christian defense of Paul would be to confess that he was indeed a preacher and he was indeed a Christian. Any other defense is a lie. And so Paul stands alone and no one speaks for him. There were some who could have. He evidently refers to friends of Christianity, people that he knew, influential people that he had in time before known. They did not speak for him, and he prays it not be held against them. And he says the Lord stood with him, and the Lord strengthened him, so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. We do not know exactly what Paul means at this moment. Moment. But this is a, a lonely place to end your story. In a prison set hard by the sewer system of Rome, packed with people, no protection from cold, no protection from heat, no food, a literal uh, a barbaric scene where you wait to know what will happen. Demas has forsaken him. Uh, he sent Crescens to Galatia there. Uh, he sent Ty Titus to Dalmatia. He sent Tychius back to Ephesus. Erastus, he's at Corinth. Trophimus, remember he got sick and was left at Miletus. Uh, there were some brethren there with him who evidently kept him alive at some level. And they sent greetings through him to Timothy in the second le letter. Uh, but of his cold companions, the only one who was with him was Luke. Uh, Luke is such an amazing contrast to Paul. Luke is a physician. And if you read the, the Gospel of Luke, you will find no one makes more tender observances of the humanity uh, of our Lord than Luke. No one tells a story that is more inclusive of Mary's point of view. No one is more gentle than the physician Luke. And yet his dear friend Paul, he has a riot on every corner in town. It's a beautiful friendship. The Lord has knit them together and Luke has stayed with them. And when they come to bring him food at this hole in the ground and the guard allows them to pass down food and, and they have to arrange it so someone else doesn't get Paul's food. And, Paul, and, and Luke, the physician, asks Paul, uh, how you doing? How you feeling? And what can you say? I'm cold. I'm sick. I'm miserable. I'll see you tomorrow. I wish there was more that I could do. And so this is the loneliness. This is the reality. Uh, Paul has come through much. He's no longer afraid of death. No one can face what he has faced and keep great respect for death. He has long since come to peace in his in his circumstance. But in this dungeon, somehow hoarding paper and pen, somehow passing out pages to Luke, he writes the second epistle to Peter. And he wants, excuse me, not to Peter, to Timothy. He wants Timothy to be encouraged. He wants Timothy to stand strong. He wants Timothy to preach the word. He wants Timothy to endure hardship. He wants Timothy to invest the word in others. He wants Timothy to fulfill his ministry. He feels his life coming to an end. And now he feels a baton being passed. And he wants... Timothy to learn some things. He wants Timothy to have a, 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 a commitment to steadfast service, to sound doctrine. And he anticipates his death. He says, Timothy, I'm ready to die. I'm not ashamed. I'm ready to die. I'm going to be poured out as a drink offering before the Lord. I'm not ashamed. Uh, I'm going to go to a better place. You can't keep me in this dungeon very long. I anticipate a day when there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me. And I'm confident that I'm going to live again.
I feel like I know Paul better than I have because it's been a very personal experience for me in a, a strange way to go through his life in the details of the daily grind. And I have found myself quite moved in the past two weeks as I've studied Paul, almost surprising myself as I moved, trying to understand the experience and the sacrifice, if only through a book. And there is no understanding through a book. There's just a little more understanding <laughs> than what you had before. And Paul at this moment seems to have lost everything. Paul who started so firmly and had such promise and such accolades and uh, a contemporary with the Sanhedrin council and as fine an educated scholar of his day that lived at that time. And this is the end. And by any cr criterion, there is a cynicism that can creep into your review of this prisoner huddled in a cold dungeon. There is a, a cynicism that can slip in. After all you've done for the church... Is this the end of your story, Paul? Why is no one speaking for you now, Paul? All those friends of the church, all those friends who were there on sunny, sunny days and in good times, where are they at, Paul? Do they even see you shivering? Paul, you don't have long and you know it. Isn't there a little bit of a sadness to the story, Paul? Isn't there a cynical edge to it all? If you want to make any sense of Paul, you have to see through Paul's world view. You have to see through Paul's faith. Because if all you see at the end of this story is a shivering, weak, weary, elderly man, hard by the Roman sewer in a dungeon, then you have fallen for a humanistic view of Paul. You have to see Paul through his faith. Finally, he says, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul seems to be a sad story, but look back at his life. Look back at his accomplishments. He's established more churches than anyone. He has written more letters than anyone. 2,000 years later, we all came on a cold holiday Wednesday night to talk about his life. And Paul, even in this prison, would be the first one to give credit to God. For I am the least of the apostles, he says, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Paul would not have a bitter note in his song at this moment. Oh, if you get too bitter in the disappointments of your commitment to God, you've adopted the world's view. You haven't adopted heaven's view. If you get too cynical in how it all ended and no one put your name in lights and no one celebrated your sacrifice and woe is you and the sad song ends, if that's the story, you've fallen for a humanistic view of the world. Paul wouldn't have that view. He would say to me, who am left? Less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Are you waiting for a sad song? Paul doesn't have one for you. Through my labors... Through my work, God has demonstrated wonderful grace and mercy, the apostle would say. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although, hear him speak, I'm formally a blasphemer, a prosecutor, an insolent man. But I obtained mercy 
I did it in ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him. For everlasting life. Paul what are you going to say? Well this is what I'm going to say. I fought a good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally there is laid up for me. The crown of righteousness. Which the Lord the righteous judge. Will give to me that day, on that day. Not just to me but to all who have loved. His appearing. And so a day comes. A day comes. When it's not Luke standing in the hole over his head. It's not Luke asking him how he's feeling. It's not Luke collecting the pages of his epistle. It's not Luke bringing food. But it's a soldier who calls down that he's going to come out. Paul's going to come out. Paul is not counseled. Paul knows not what to expect. They don't inform prisoners in the manner of a day in which we live where prisons, uh, prisoners are, are quite able to sue the system and quite successfully. Uh, he's summarily hauled out of this dungeon. He's a shadow of his former self. You put anyone in that type of environment, it will break them. You put an elderly man in that environment, it will break them faster. And so a decision has been made, but Paul probably doesn't know. Uh, he is lifted out of the dungeon and uh, somebody, maybe not Nero... Probably wouldn't have gone that high. It probably was made at a lower level. It was probably done uh, in just thoughtless manner. But Paul is going to be slain. Uh, there, there is fear that there would be a riot in the city. So in the manner of beloved prisoners, he's not going to be slain in a public place. They're not going to hoist him on the wall of the city. They're not going to crucify him on a corner of a... Uh, of a town, of a, of a road leading to the city. They're going to let his death be banal and forgotten. And so the soldier brings him out, and there they bind him, bind his hands, and they begin to march him through this city, the city that he's preached to and prayed for. Now he's marching out of the city. He's filthy. He's weak. He's probably walking with difficulty. Behind him come the soldiers. There's not many of them. There's no need. It's not like the day when he had an escort of hundreds to avoid the rioting Jews when he left Jerusalem. It's a banal execution. And so they march him out of the city. And as he walks, he reflects undoubtedly on everything that has happened to him here. At some point, prisoners become expert at reading the body language of their, their guards. And at some moment, probably right away, Paul knows his end has come. He walks from the city and they walk behind him. What must have he thought about on that last walk? There's so many churches that he could remember. There's so many blessings that he can thank God for. There's so much goodness, and yet there is, like there is for all of us, there is the pain, and there is the disappointment, and there is the regret, and there is the sadness. And yet he walks out of the city. At some point, I cannot help but believe that he felt a great identity at this moment. With all the believers... That he had marched outside of the walls of city. They didn't stone people inside the city. They stoned them outside the wall. And Paul had walked as they led Stephen out of the city. And Paul had held the coats while they threw the rocks. And now Paul's the one walking out of the city. And I think there is in Paul a perfect, a perfect embrace of this moment. 
Because if there's one great regret that echoes through his writings front to back, it is that he persecuted believers. Now he's the one walking. And maybe he thought at this moment he'd have a chance to soon talk to Stephen and apologize. They walk him out of the city, out to the Ostian Road, outside of Rome, actually near present day the Basilica of St. Paul at the time it was outside the city. Interesting, isn't it? They tried to build the Basilica of St. Paul near where he was killed. And there they unceremoniously lead him away from the road, out of view. They don't want to make it a big deal. They don't want, they just wanted a problem to be solved. And however they did it, whether they knelt him upon his knees probably would have been the most common. Whether they stood him in some position, however it was, at some point, a Roman soldier heaved a sword, heaved an axe, heaved something, lifted it high, and with one strong stroke brought the earthly journey of the Apostle Paul to an end. It's sad. And yet, I wish that we could have had some kind of a little ceremony. I wish some believers could have walked out with him. I wish somebody could have been there to quote back to Paul his own words. It's sad, yes, and we mourn, yes. But we don't mourn like the unbeliever. It's sad, yes, and we cry, yes. But we don't cry like the unbeliever. Because one of these days, if that same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, that same spirit shall quicken your mortal body. And you can know in your faith there's no grave that can hold your body down. None of us could be there, but if we could, I'd like to sing this, Paul, this song for Paul. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn through the storm, through the night. Lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. Let's stand. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you lift your hands all across the house? Let's praise the Lord for His greatness. Hallelujah. Let me... Let me read some of Paul's last words. We've been reading them several times tonight, but let me back up. And read this as a, a final farewell. This is Paul to Timothy, yes, but I'd like it to be more than to Timothy. I'd like to be all of us, okay? This is not Paul being sentimental. All the sentimentality was me. <laughs> all the sadness was my sadness. I told the story sad because to me it's sad. Paul would tell it to you like this. I charge you therefore being before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. 
For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Paul doesn't want a sad pity party. Paul wants you to pick up your sword. Paul doesn't want you to sing a sad song. I'm the one singing a sad song. Paul wants you to reach up and grab a hold of the calling of God on your life. And say there's nothing that can separate me from the love of God. And Paul's last farewell. This is how Paul says goodbye. The Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Let's praise the Lord one more time. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your promise. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. We praise you today. We thank you for your mighty great blessings in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Smile at your neighbor. Say, who knows what he's going to teach on next. <laughs> God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great week. Greet one another. We love you all. God bless you. Thank you for watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte.